I'm, I'm here with Sam Stemmler, author, and Sam has just released a book, uh, and um, I want you know I want you to talk about your book, and you know we're going to talk about that, and also uh, about your life as an artist. You know, sounds it, great. <laughs> that's does that sound too pretentious? Doesn't it? <laughs> My life as an artist. <laughs> um, no, not at all. No, you're, not, you're supposed to it's sound talking like this. My life as an artist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my right. My life as an artist, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, well, first of all, um, uh, tell us the name of your book, mm -hmm. and then I want you to read the blurb, which would be the thing that we c um, would normally appear on the back of the book. Right. Although yours is, a, is an e-book, an electronic book, so mm -hmm. uh, there wouldn't be a blurb. But go ahead and uh, read that for sure, us. Sure, yeah. So like you said, it's an e-book. It's called uh, Monster Force. Monster Force is the series name. Uh, this first one, the introductory uh, book in the series, is called Murder in Metal Neck. And so, yes, here is the, uh, the blurb from the Amazon page. It's the classic hard-boiled detective tale meets alluring urban noir with a monstrous twist in the grips of vampires and mages. In the city of Burgundy, vicious monsters and dark magicians walk in shadows and in the crowds. Monster Force detectives are all that stand between honest citizens and the edge of dark magic. A young woman murdered in the Metal Neck district of Burgundy sparks an investigation the likes of which Monster Force detectives Ollie and Elle were never prepared for. From ancient white mages' halls to vampire bankers' modern castles to the city's monster-infested underworks, the detectives uncover a plot much darker even than murder. Even than murder. murder. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, what I wanted to hear a little bit about is um, your two characters, L and Ollie, mm -hmm. and uh, tell a, just tell a little bit about you know what they're like. The 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 people they are and maybe their special uh, abilities or something sure. should we say? Yeah. Um, so actually the, the novel is kind of was originally inspired by uh, Law and Order SVU. Yeah. So in SVU yeah. there is um, Stabler and um, she's I can't think of her name right now. Um, Benson. Stabler and oh, Benson. Oh Benson. Yeah. Yep. Benson, definitely. And yeah. so I basically just took kind of those two characters but I wanted he's Elliot Stabler and she's L and then oh, uh, yeah. yeah um and then she's Olivia Benson and he's Ollie so I just kind of switched their names oh, there <laughs> and I wanted to add a uh yeah a supernatural twist to sort of Law and Order SVU and so Ollie and L are the not new detectives but not terribly experienced but uh Ollie likes to think that he is and uh, they are investigating a murder that turns into something uh, yeah, much, much deeper and darker than that. And he's, he's sort of a, your standard tough guy, hard-boiled detective. And I guess she would be his uh, more reasonable female counterpart. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and, um, but are they, are they um, regular human beings or do they have yes, special... Yes, yes. They are regular human beings. They do not have special powers. They are given... I guess magical apparatus, uh, it's sort of like uh, you know holy guns, kind of like holy water guns, that oh, sort of thing. Oh, I see. Uh, and then they have sorcerers that white magic sorcerers that help them investigate these crimes. Um, but no, they are just your average. They are just like you and me, except they're detectives. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool. All right. That helps, you know, explain it. But mm -hmm. there are a lot of other kinds of people. In, yes. in this world. Yes, there are. Yeah. Yes, they have a lot to contend with. <laughs> All right. So um, some people plot their stories ahead of time and others write by what they call seat of the pants. Or yeah. They make it up as they go along. What is your writing process like? I am definitely a so-called pantser. Is that right? <laughs> yes. I oh, because when I see your work, I mean, you really carry it through very cleanly. So you, do you have to go back a lot? And Yes, I would say that, yeah, when... I kind of, at first, I kind of write certain scenes of, of each book that I write, and then I think the connecting scenes kind of come together next, and then a sort of, uh, like, overall conflict presents, and, and I don't know, it's probably about mid, not even midway through, I would say about 25% of the way through the book, a conflict is there, and I kind of know where I'm going, even if I don't always know the end. So, yeah. and then after that, once it's all done, then you go back and change this, you know, for continuity and that sort of thing. And, so and the then it looks like it was yeah. very well planned. <laughs> yeah, because it does. <laughs> Thank it, you. It, it seems like that. And, 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 and uh, uh, so that's why I asked the question, because I've, I've started to understand that 
all writers, whatever process they use, um, it requires editing anyway. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, the the way I do, I collect a bunch of ideas first until I see the whole picture. Right. Not the whole picture, but I mean, I know the through line, mm -hmm. and then I do that same thing of writing. Certain it's scenes like, come yeah. to me, and then I ha I already know what has to be filled in between. But I'm still always surprised. Yeah. The nice thing about that, I think, writing about writing that way is. If you find a scene that you just don't want to write that's very boring, it's like, well, if I don't want to write it, does anyone want to read it? <laughs> you know, how, how necessary is uh, this? So oh, yeah. Can I just add a sentence here about something that happened in the intermin? You know, do I, do I need this scene? So if you don't want to write it, they don't want to read it. But whereas, that's same sort of thing, if you feel compelled to write a scene, hopefully you can find a place for it in the book because it probably needs to be there. It needs be to be there. Yeah. yeah. I, would, I would hope, I would think. Although I have written scenes that, you, that did have to get cut for... You know this, that, or the other reason that I really enjoyed. But sometimes you gotta. What are they? What's this? The phrase you gotta kill your darlings or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> In the editing process, yeah. it happens. So, so did d when you make that decision? Is it because someone else looked at it and suggested that maybe it didn't belong? Is that? Um, no. I think usually the way that happens is it's some kind of scene that I just recognize as superfluous. And I think as I kind of get the characters developed in my mind, these scenes present themselves. Uh, like in the new novel that I'm working on, there's a scene where, uh, <laughs> one that, a scene that I just wrote today, where Ollie goes to visit a, a new detective who happens to be a vampire at his gym. <laughs> and I really don't think any, that scene's ever going to make it into any book. But it's good to help develop this new character. But, well, and his character, too, Ollie's character. Oh, I see. So, so part of it is you're working through the development of the character, mm -hmm. and then you can put it aside. I, I've heard writers who, um, they actually write page after page of things that the character did when they were a kid mm -hmm. and, and things that happened to them and, and that so that they have it clear in their head who the character is, and then they put it aside so that it, it's in the background in their yep. mind when they're, when they're yeah, writing. Yeah, I think that, that's, that's, I think, a good process. I think... In, in my opinion, my humble opinion, I think that the characters are what people really like to read. And whenever I've heard people describe a book that they really like, it's usually they remember a lot of things about the character. And I mean, of course, you know, the plot is very important, too. You got to have a consistent plot. But I think it's the characters where people see themselves. So the better developed uh -huh. I think you have of a character, the, the better I think your story is going to be and the more people are going to enjoy it. For me, I, you know, I'm really interested in dialogue mm -hmm. and it it. That's what excites me when I read other people's work. Ah, okay. I, now, I like, I need to know enough about the place where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, we've heard this uh, thing called white room syndrome, you know, where you just have people and you go, well, where are they? You know, what, right, are, they, yeah. what are they doing? Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I just like that, that interplay. That's what attracts me. And For so sure. it's yeah. probably, and you know. That, that definitely has become way more important. I think I've learned a lot about doing dialogue. Whenever you do any kind of interrogation scene in between detectives, between a suspect, whenever you do any kind of back and forth between the detectives, that's all dialogue. So it better be good. <laughs> yes. That's another, that's a big one. But also their, their reaction. You, you get to see their mm -hmm. face. You describe right. what they're think or what they're doing. And sometimes depending if, if you're in a character's head, you can, you know, put some subtext or, or uh, italicize or right, what yeah. What's your method for that? I, I can't remember. Right I now. still do the, and I, this is sort of an old school of thought, I think. Uh, I still like the italicized yeah. thoughts. I like to italicize thoughts because when I'm reading a book and the thoughts aren't italicized, I, I find myself going back and like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> you know, what is, we were describing, you know, this situation and all of a sudden we're like first person, I think this. And it takes me a second. So, but when I, when it's italicized and it's set off, I know immediately, all right, now I'm thinking of the character. This is, this is Ollie, this is Al, this is, you know, or if you're reading someone else's book, this is Steve, George, whatever. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, um, there are people who do that, but they, the way that, uh, uh, don't use the italics, um, mm -hmm. but there, you, have to, you have to introduce it a certain way so that we know that we're in their head, you know. Right. And, and it's sometimes it's like middle of the paragraph kind of stuff. And yeah, it's I, I, for me, it's it's confusing. I'm sure, you know, people who read that all the time, they never have read italicized thoughts. That's, you know, perfectly natural. And then the italicization would be, you know, could be kind of distracting to them. But I guess that's sort of just like 
I don't know. Opinion. I've just that's by then it's just sort of an, a point of opinion. Well, until everybody starts doing no italics, and then I might have to oh, make the switch. <laughs> now we have to learn that. But you know, I've seen so much of it. a lot of the writers that I read uh, are, use italics, so that oh, I know. Oh, good, good. It's still yeah. it's still a thing. Though. Now maybe I'm reading <laughs> old books. You know, what inspires you? What do you like to read? Mm -hmm. um, and while well, we you mentioned the uh, SVU mm -hmm. uh, yep. Law and Order, uh, so there must be movies and TV shows and things. Just uh, you know, talk about some of those things. That sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess inspiration kind of comes from anywhere. The first novel that I wrote was actually inspired by a song that I heard. Um, a later novel was inspired by a video game that I played. Um, yeah, and this one, I guess, was loosely inspired by Law & Order SVU. I was yeah. doing a really serious SVU binge for a while, so <laughs> it kind of got all the There's thoughts There's a lot going. of it. How many years did they do? Are they many, still doing it? I don't think I, and I watched it a lot, but I, did, I still haven't seen all the episodes. And I think it either recently ended or it's still going. Because I, I saw a fairly new episode not that long ago. It might be still going. At least 10 years. Worth. Yeah. At Once they got rid of iced tea, it wasn't really the same for me. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> I like the iced tea. He's, he's good. Maybe the, yeah, right, right. Uh, so, so lots of things. Anything, all different kinds yeah, of things I think, will get you. I mean, even just sort of like day-to-day -day situations, maybe that's the, the biggest thing is like if you don't feel like you have to express something, I guess, or it usually starts for me like something is I'm troubled <laughs> about something, you know. So it has to get written out, and that's sort of my way of uh, kind of, I guess, working through that a little bit. So I think that's sort of maybe the root of it, whereas a lot of the movies, the shows, the even the music is sort of like top-level imagery kind of stuff, you know, imagery inspiration. But the problem is, is is always there. Sometimes I don't know exactly what it is at that time, though. Oh, you, <laughs> it becomes you have, evident later. That's how later. you work it out. Exactly. You're trying to figure out right. what is, what's bothering me. Huh? Yep. So almost... A, like a like an anxiety build and you need to like work through it almost or? yeah I think that's yeah I, I think that and this is something that I kind of realized uh, I don't know a few years ago that there was there was these themes of things that when I would write a book I was like oh then it, when you know in retrospect I'd look back and be like well this is obviously about this this was troubling me at the time you know um, when I wrote The King of the Sun in college, it was this like 900 page epic about someone with really severe anxiety problems. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, wow, I wonder what that's about. <laughs> but ah. it's just amazing because I really couldn't see it at the time. And I don't think a lot of, well, I kind of hope that it's not that clear to other people because it's not supposed to be that clear. But yeah, and I would say, um, yeah, they're not like, it's not like a one to one thing, you know, that one was a little more one to one. But like the Soldier Sons, the other book that I did recently, um, that was really about, I guess, finding a place, finding a home, maybe fighting for your, your position or uh, where you feel like you belong. And I think that was kind of what I was going through at that time, too. So. Well, now, uh, you mentioned Soldier Son, which is your previous series. And is it is it five books in that series? It is five books, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Their and five books are all about mm, 100, 200 pages. Now, the... It, it, you have the main character, well, he's sort of a, I'm saying the guy, is, do you consider the guy the main character, or? Um, he wasn't supposed to be, but he kind of turned into, again, the, well, the, the being a pantser. Well, <laughs> he kind of turned into the main character yeah, a little he, bit. You know, he's there, nebulous, and we see him, but there's a, 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 a female character right. that I really think is sort of the main character, because we get to see this other guy through her eyes exactly yeah and we learn about him that way mm -hmm, yeah um yeah you don't you there's not really much actually from his perspective i think the last book there is more because he becomes a, a sort of key character in the conflict but um no i think for the for, for most of the books yeah i think the female character would be more the main character yeah, yeah. and uh that's i also describe that as a, i would describe it as kind of a dark um i mean Overall, I f it seems to take place in a dark, a darker world. It is, world. yeah, yeah. I don't know if I've ever written anything that's not sort of a dark novel. Uh, <laughs> it's not really in me to uh, okay, so give you me blood, who give like me skulls, the dark give stuff. me death. <laughs> this is this is <laughs> this where to is go. It. This is the person here. <laughs> <laughs> if I had you at death and skulls, then we will <laughs> oh, <let's yeah>. <laughs> read oh. the books. <laughs> So um, uh, I don't know to go a lot into that, but I do want to say that uh, these are only available now on Amazon. Yeah. 
Okay. That's sort okay. of the yeah. platform that the majority of people seem to use. So I That's figured. the one that everybody, you know, most people know about. Exactly. You know, whether yeah. they love or hate it, whatever. They yeah, <laughs> mixed mixed emotions about yeah, Amazon yeah. for sure. Well, and uh, so I want to talk about this too because the, the difficult part for all people doing I independent publishing is um, this thing: how do we draw people to what we're doing? Right. And it's it's extremely difficult. Well, for instance, I'll. I'll talk for a minute and th there's a fellow that I know who um, wanted he, he went to a vanity publisher and uh, he was asking my opinion about it. I said it's I don't think it's a good idea because I said y right now you what you're resistant is trying to find an agent you know because it's a difficult job and so you're trying not to do that but in the end you're going to end up with a thousand books that are going to be in your closet right. and you're going to have to sell them to your friends yeah or people that you even people you don't know and it's another sales job regardless mm -hmm. you have to sell somewhere along the line you sell to one agent or you sell to 500 or 1000 people yeah and so in the end uh, he ended up with a closet full of books as many 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 of us do which is why <laughs> yeah, I, I have I mean I don't know between I guess the amount of books that I have is not that bad considering I, you know, of all the books that I've written, I've paper copies of all of them. So, oh, do you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, up until this new one, because this I ended up, I've, I, and I've moved, I've moved house, you know, uh, uh, there's, there was a time where I moved house like three times in a year. So oh, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah, you're, you, then you, you know you how many, you know exactly yeah. how many books you have when yeah. you're hauling them here and there and everywhere. <laughs> so I've been trying to cut down on paper copies, which is why I haven't yeah. made any of this new novel ah, at this I point. See. Um, I also started a new job, so that that kind of complicated a, a little bit of the of uh, my my sort of ultimate plan of publishing. I was gonna make some paper copies. I probably still will, but I definitely will make like ten. <laughs> you know, yeah, ten uh -huh. is kind of the cap. Yeah. <laughs> if I will hopefully be able to make them available for order, because I know not everybody reads eBooks. Actually, I don't. I don't read eBooks like all that often. I still prefer paper books myself. Right. So okay. yeah, I will still make them available for ordering. Um, but the other thing that's interesting that you bring up about like vanity publishers and you know having a thousand books in your closet, people have asked like, well, why why do you only order like so many of, of why do you only order like 10, 20 books and why are they expensive? You know, why are these books why do they cost you this much to print? And it's because, like you said, if you don't print 10,000 copies, mm -hmm. then they're very affordable. You know, economies of scale. But uh, if you want to print 10, then each book costs like 10 bucks. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, it's but. Yeah, well, that's I'm thinking about the one that you just did. Um, if if you were to do them on Lulu, yeah, um, you could probably do them for about. It would cost you about five dollars, including shipping. If you buy, especially when they're on, they have sales frequently, mm -hmm. uh, and they will yeah. include shipping. So shipping is free. Yeah, I always go for the free shipping ones because yeah. those are usually the that's the most expensive part. When you can get the the twenty percent off and the free shipping deal, oh that's man, it. we should send them this video. Maybe we'll get a coupon. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we I I use I don't know. Do you use um, Amazon's uh, create? What is theirs again? Create space. Create space. Create yeah. space. That's right. Do you use that one or do you use a different? Well, one? Well, I did that for the first book, mm -hmm. and then I found out that. Um, what I was hoping to do is build some interest, see what happened. But really, it, I had kind of given up because, um, uh, you know, I'd approached probably about 70 agents and said, well, clearly this isn't something that, you know, they want. Right. Uh, and so I went ahead and put it on Amazon. Well, then I found out once you put your stuff on Amazon, uh, agents are no longer, they don't want to talk to you. Right. I I've went, what? That. What mm -hmm. do you mean? They said, well... Uh, you're trying to uh, bypass us and uh, put us out of work. And I said, I'm not trying. I tried. If you'd have taken the book, I would have gone with you. Yeah. Well, you know, but, you know, the only time they want to tell you how to behave is after you've, you know, done something that if they'd have helped you in the first place. Of you course, know. yeah. So, so it's a kind of a weird situation, but um, I wanted to see how it would go, too. You right, know. sure. But the second book that I wrote, um, I put it on, I, I went to Lulu and did not make it public. Because I, I needed to get copies in people's right, hands yeah. who wouldn't read an ebook, for instance, and, and get feedback. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, because then I can still go to agents because it's not listed anywhere in the world yep. except in their little invoice database. You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah. And so That's I did not, that. I don't think ever considered. I don't know if they consider that publishing. I think they just consider that printing. So you should be. No, those yeah. are personal copies. Right. And they yeah. Wouldn't, mm -hmm. So the agents are not 
they're not going to get on you about that. Right. But what they do, I've, agents, have, they said some of the first thing they do is look up and find you on the web, and they look on Amazon. If you're there, they walk away. That's Yeah, that's interesting. When I first got into the game, I guess, in uh, 2011, yeah, 2011, um, one of the reasons that I first started self-publishing was I heard that after you had approached agents, if that didn't work, if you self-published a book and you s could sort of make a business case for it yeah. and you could show that people liked it, then that was a good way to actually get agent interest. I think, though, because the, that the market has changed a little bit, because uh, it was very different even in 2011. So uh, I don't, yeah, they, I think, have changed their minds a little bit about that. Well, no, it's still correct. Um, they will take a book. But you have to have proof. You, the, the number is ten thousand. When ah. your book hits ten thousand, the phone starts ringing. Right. Yeah. And you go, but I, why do I need you then? Yeah. You yeah. know, uh, and uh, there's a fellow right here in Holt who is uh, selling. He's he's sold a million books now. Oh wow. And uh, when his book started to, to ten thousand, they started calling him, and he said, well, uh, what what can you do for me? He says, I make eighty five percent now. Right. And yeah. they said, well, we'll give you that. We'll give you 7%. He said, excuse <laughs> me, I'm making 85. You have to send, sell five, I don't know the math, five times more books. Yeah. Uh, to a lot more than that if he's making 85% from eight. You there say? you go. Th yeah. Yeah. There was a, and it was a small number. And, and they said, well, okay. And then he said, then they called like a week later and said, okay, 12%, you know. <laughs> like, no. And he just went, <laughs> you're nuts, you know. Yeah. And they said, well, we can distribute further. And he said, yeah, but. Again, you, you have to sell so much. He says, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. You guys had your chance because he tried to get through to agents. Right, and, yeah. and, uh, but he said they, they actually, and he's in marketing, so he kind of knew how to sure. reach people and how to get on, uh, 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 what is it, New York Times bestseller. Huh? He said um, what they do is they, they actually have a marker set. They have people in the, in the companies that are looking they're waiting until a book hits 10,000 and then they make the calls. Sure. And it's just like an algorithm that they use. And he said it wasn't just one publisher that called that week. Oh he said, no, he I said bet not. three called in the first week yeah. that that hit 10,000. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was really interesting to hear that. So the answer is yes. But how the heck are you or I right, going to yeah. get, you know, we didn't come from a and marketing background. And by then I would, share his, I would share his a view, you know, and a little bit, I mean, he had a pretty good financial reason for telling them no I'm happy where I am mine would be a little bit more vindictive I think it would be a little more like you said no to me before so you can all shove it <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know hopefully I can be a little more mature than that but yeah it would be hard to choose if you're already if they only want you when you're already being really successful being self-published you kind of got to wonder yeah why do I need you do I need you and I think I there's been many authors that have had that exact thought there are people who are quite successful, literally self-publishing all of their books. And uh, yeah, they don't, they, no, they have no interest in doing, uh, which I personally I think is, gosh, I shouldn't say this, if I couldn't get published, if I couldn't get traditionally published before, I won't be able to after this. <laughs> but um, well, I would say that that's a good thing because it democratizes uh, publishing. Whereas before you had, you know, these publishing gatekeepers that were telling everybody oh, yeah. what they should read, not even what they should read, but they were saying what was available to read. Because traditional publishers are in bookstores, are in libraries, you know, they're the people uh, that are available. Right. And if you weren't in line with what they were interested in or what they thought people were interested in, what, what perhaps what they wanted people to be interested in, even if you want to go a level higher, uh, you didn't get published. But now, you know, that's, uh, there's at least an option for, you know, getting your book out in front of people. Yeah. Well, and, and the, the other part, too, is that uh, has been pointed out is that Amazon... They, if they have 10 million writers out there who are only selling one book a year, uh, that's 10 million books that they're selling. Yeah. If they have, like, if a publisher has 20 authors that they're featuring, mm -hmm. and they sell, they have to sell thousands of books. And right. So it's really more difficult for the a standard publisher. Amazon doesn't really care because they're going with oh, yeah. the large numbers. No, Amazon, Amazon makes out like a bandit on this whole deal. Uh, you know, again, sounding a little negative of, of the system of being the, sort of anti-system. Of our publisher, here, you know, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. It's, it's sort of an unfortunate predicament the way that it is because you, what you basically have in traditional publishing is the big five publishers yep. own a great majority of this market. There are some. And then even if you look at, if you open a book, <laughs> for our viewers, if you open a book 
just any book on your shelf, see what publisher it's from, and you'll say, oh, it's from a smaller publisher, and then find out who owns that publisher. Who and I guarantee it? you it's one of the big five. Yeah. It's, there are very few books that are really successful that are not owned by them. Um, so there's, that's one. And then there's Amazon, who has basically, I guess Witch has basically uh, just eaten alive this you know, e-book market. They kind of destroyed, not destroyed, but they, they did a much better job than Barnes & Noble's platform did. They're still around, but... You know, they've they Amazon has just an enormous amount of financial power to wield, and that, not exactly. in not even remotely in books. I mean, their all of their financial power comes from a great deal of other things. But uh, yeah, and so kind of for me, a little bit is like, yes, they make books available to you know make it possible for people to publish, self-publish, which is great. Uh, but also, I don't feel super good about you know putting my book on Amazon because they are. I mean, they're squeezing out bookstores. They're squeezing out. Uh, well, I th I think of them of as voracious. Are, you know, they are very voracious. Voracious and, is a and, good word. And I've, I may be uh, misspeaking here, but I I heard that their goal was to put all other publishers out of business. Now that may be wrong. That may just be been word that's been spread by publishers. You know. Yeah, I mean, it certainly would be great for them. Yeah. The sad part also is that I think. Uh, and again, this is you know I sort of easy to critique when you're not. I'm not Amazon. I'm I don't I'm not the CEO. So you know yeah. it's easy for me to say what they're doing wrong. But uh, they they only really police any of their eBooks, which is again in a part good thing, free speech, but not always a great thing because they only ever do any kind of even quality, much not even content necessarily, no. but quality policing when they absolutely have to. And it's yeah. only after many 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 people have complained. And a great example of that was when they started, they, someone finally brought to their attention the quality of the books on Amazon, and particularly of like a sexual content, that it was really bad. Oh. Uh, and like kind of stuff that you didn't want your kids reading, didn't oh, really want, I, I'm, I didn't want to read it as an adult. <laughs> you uh -huh. know, it was pretty gross. And then, you know, many people had already said this, and only when they did a, an article, several articles on Business Insider about it, then, oh my God, Amazon had no idea that this was going on. And then they put in these content, and you still see it, these ridiculous, you know, erotica type books, and some that are really sleazy. And it's, it, it's kind of what, it's, sadly, it's what puts down really the whole industry, what makes people who want to write a good book, and worse than that, just people that, you know, don't put quality, don't put time into their book. And people who, if that's the first self-published book that they read, they pick this up. They say, this was crap. Nobody put any effort into this. Self-published books must all be like this. I'm not going to read them. And it really does a disservice to people who are just trying to get readers, you know, that, that do want to put effort into their book. So, I want to ask a little bit um, about what your writing ritual is. I mean, oh. do you actually, do you, because um, you're working on another one, you said, right now, or, or the second in this series. Yep. And um, so, like, do you do you, uh, some people say they get up at 5 a.m. and they write until they have to go to work or mm -hmm. uh, they they may, uh, uh, you know, write after. Is it, Do you have any particular way or do you just go at it? You know, you have enough of that drive that you have to do it. Um, well, I think like so the way that you you're writing, everyone's writing ritual probably depends a lot on their lifestyle and. My life, it's every time my lifestyle changes, you know, I, I, my writing ritual changes a little bit. So, yeah, right now, I, I, for a while, I was doing freelance writing. So it was sort of like go to bed whenever I want, wake up whenever I want, write whenever I want, uh, which was great uh, for a while. Um, and now I'm working, you know, for a, a business, you yeah. know, doing the kind of traditional nine to five. So my writing ritual has definitely changed a little bit. Uh, I'm still kind of feeling that one out at this point uh, yeah. a little bit. So. Uh, but yeah, that's the, I would say, you know, I've heard a lot of people say that, um, you know, you got to write for an hour a day or, you know, like th this amount per week. And, and that's great. I think people, you, if you find that it's very difficult to write and it's, you know, you, you almost don't want to do it, then you should probably have that sort of ritual. You know, you shouldn't use, I guess, you know, being eclectic as an excuse not to do it, as an excuse for a lack of discipline. Um, but for me, that kind of like you have to write it every day turns it into a job. It turns it into a chore. So sure, that sure. has never really worked for me because it just it takes all the joy out. Of, not all. It takes much of the joy out of it for me. And a lot of then what I write just becomes this dry crap. <laughs> I mean, so for me, it was always more of a like I have this really good idea. I'm going to write this down. And then it, when it really when the inspiration strikes like that, 
it's, again, that sounds a little pretentious, but um, then it's like any spare moment that I have, I am writing that. And notebooks, computers, you know, I've probably got like 20 notebooks just floating around my house. <laughs> like yeah. this, that, and the other thing. And I'll go feverishly through them. Where did I put this part? Where did I put that part? You know, there should be a better organization system. I'm still working on that one. <laughs> I see. So yeah. that so, as you said, the it's change. You're 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 still finding your Absolutely, place, but yeah. but when you're inspired, it, oh, you know I notice that too. It comes. It's like, you know, you say, oh, I'm gonna, I got this idea. You're right, and then you go and you start doing something else. And let's say you're cooking, and you're going, what about if I tried this? You know, and mm -hmm. and it just keeps coming at you. You can't yeah. stop it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that I think is for for me. And again, I don't think people should. Some people really need that. They need to write every day because otherwise they just never will do it. Um, but it, it shouldn't be a rule for like everybody because everybody's different, you know. So I think that, yeah, my writing ritual is definitely more of a when it's there and when it needs to get written, it's going to get written. And kind of a lot of other things start to take, take go by the sidelines once, once that really inspiration strikes. Well, I wonder what it becomes like if if you end up do get a contract and then you have a deadline and you're supposed to turn out yeah, stuff yeah that would be kind of tough and i think writers even you know very famous writers have run into that and i think it kind of if you really look into it i think it kind of shows in their work sometimes that i mean you look at uh you know the game of thrones guy george r r martin he ha has not finished that series it seems as though he has no intention of finishing that series <laughs> and i think that's exactly what happened <laughs> I, I think he wanted to go at his own pace and you know he had his his own ritual yeah. and then once it was like hey uh so george what's uh, what's the story with this yeah. book it was just so much pressure maybe or maybe it was the pressure or maybe the idea just wasn't there anymore or who knows but i think his ritual got you know upset and it wasn't the same well it, and and you we move we get other ideas that inspire get us excited and we're i have to you know, I have to go back to that, and it becomes uh, becomes like a factory job. You exactly, know? yeah. And, and that's, I think, what you really want to avoid in writing. If it, it, it should be fun, you know. Uh, otherwise, if, if, if writing's not fun, then, you know, I mean, I do like, uh, or I, I had previously done sort of like a version of technical writing. Then do that. That's a job, <laughs> you yeah, know. Then, then yeah. But it should be fun. Well, if it does, if it ends up being, uh, you know, if it, tur it turns into a thing where it is really profitable, uh, you know, that could be, I don't know, I haven't figured that out. Mm -hmm. I think I can write on demand. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done it before where I just said, okay, I'm going to finish this thing, and, and uh, I can do that, and I can find fun moments along the sure, way. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's, you know, that's a good point. There is still a level of, it's not like it's all inspiration all the time. There's still a level of, uh, and then this happens to me a lot when I reach sort of the end of the book, especially when I already know how it's going to end then it's like, all right, just sit down and finish it already, you know? Oh, yeah. And I guess it's a little bit of it when it sort of loses the new, the novelty for yeah. me when I, oh, man, I'm, you know, when I'm discovering all these new things that are happening, you know, yeah. being a pantser. Uh, but once I kind of know how it's going to end and everything, the way it all wraps up, then it's sort of like, oh, all right, I guess I'll write it. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's still, it's, there is a level of, there is still that level of discipline that needs to go into it because it would be very easy to just let it go and okay I know how it ends so that's that's enough I don't need to finish this right. and there have been stories that I have done that with <laughs> for sure for sure I would I don't know I've run into that thing but I get enough out of it when I do it mm -hmm. that even when I'm writing a thing that just has to be a fill I know what has to be there it ha it, I belong sure. I still can say. I'm surprised by the con the uh, dialogue that happens. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. and also solving little problems, little yep. little things. I, I know I have to this because a lot of times I will say I know how it's got to end, but it doesn't have enough punch or whatever mm -hmm. it is. And then I get to that and I go, how can I how can I give this something really exciting? Well, I'll give you one example. The uh, the the last wor one that I that I wrote, um, there was a, 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 a I s sat with a guy. A uh, Hollywood consultant, and he said, um, "the the the thing that the book that you're describing, or the the plot that you're describing, usually has the person coming into this realm, whatever it is, and then they're uh, 
uh, they leave. You know, they realize it's not for them, and they grow up. They have to, you know, they have this thing. They think they need to be in there, and they have to get, then they realize they have to leave. And I said, no, I want him to come back. But it gave me the idea that I could have him leave and then come back. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the people are going, oh, my God, he left. He left, we want him to be there. Yeah. And then I give it back to them. Exactly, you know? yeah. And, and that's, so that's part of the excitement of it, too. Yeah. Sometimes when you think you got a boring part, it turns out that it's not. How can I solve it and make else. it fun? Yeah. And make it fun for me, too. <laughs> exactly, you know? yeah. And those are the great moments when you think, oh, all right, I got to sit down and finish it. And then it turns into something yeah. new, which happens a lot, actually. So part of the fun. Yeah. That's a, it's, it's, well, I, I think of it as puzzle solving. It is. You know? Yeah, it's, I, I would mean, agree. We could be sitting down and doing the New York Times uh, crossword puzzle, mm -hmm. which a lot of people do every day, spend hours on it, and then they just throw the paper away. Or we could be doing something that is much, you know, it's an artistic endeavor, yeah. you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe somebody else will be inspired by it or learn something. Uh, that is the hope, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we just got to get it in more hands. Please, people. Come on. Get this book. <laughs> And get the other ones too. You'll see. All right. That's a that's a good point though. The I guess uh, something that I was just I've been thinking about a lot lately is the, you know why especially when we've talked about what a struggle this self publishing is, uh, why why do you do it? What's the point? You know if certainly it's enjoyable to write, but then if you want other people to read it, you got to ask yourself then like what, you know why why do I want them to read it? What's the point? So but I think what you said having a message you know maybe making people think about something or uh, also maybe sharing a, if you have a struggle that you've conveyed in your book maybe sharing that and for if it were to just to know reach one person I feel like that would be that would be enough you know to reach one person on a deeper level that would be yeah that's what human beings um, do we we can uh, communicate to each other and if, if that weren't the case, we'd still be living hand to mouth and we've developed, we, we have houses and we, we uh, uh, do something for pay so that we don't have to go out and kill our own animals, you know, to eat and that. And we don't, right. all, all these kind of things. Well, a, a part of that is a drive to communicate, mm -hmm. especially to our children. You know, sure. that's where I think that's where it comes from. If we do that well, then they then the genes go on. Sure. That's it's a genetic thing, you know, mm -hmm. and the the ones who are more successful at that, uh, the ones who were not successful at that, their line died out, you know. So the ones who have, you know, the, the, I think it's just, in, it's a thing that's built into humans that there's, we have this anxiety that we have to communicate. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what makes us a successful, you know, in fact, in, in uh, danger of overpopulating the earth right. because it's been such a successful method. But it also makes our artistic endeavors uh, a, you sure. know a drive why we have to do this and that's why we think we always think that same thing exactly if yeah. one person you know gets something out of it that makes their life different or changes that's exactly the those are the words aren't they yeah you yeah know? I think yeah that's I guess I never thought about that that sort of innate need to communicate that's a big part of it yeah and I would say that even more than, you know, the desire to communicate it with the next generation, although certainly that, that's important, but also just with, you know, like-minded people, I guess, to find someone, I don't know, it sounds a little melodramatic, but to make, you, to make you think that I'm not alone, I'm not the only one that thinks the way that I do. You know, other people say, wow, yes, I, this reached me, you know, and then you can say, yes. Me too. <laughs> we uh, are like right, we are kindred right. spirits. It's we are in society together. It's that that need for a community. I think perhaps is is a part of it too. Your scenes are very vivid, Thank you know, you. and you. And I was curious about what is your process of world building? Do you kind of mm. you you put your character and you're thinking about it, or I, I know a seat of your pants, but you don't just start there. You have some concept before you start writing even the first yeah. chapter. I'm sure. I would say it probably comes from first there's definitely like a loose skeleton of what you want the world to be. So for 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 this story for Monster Force it was um, you know I want it to be similar to SVU. So it had to be urban, it had to be you know maybe similar to New York or Chicago. I believe yeah, in the city of in the city of New York, I think is where SVU takes place. Yeah. yeah I've just watched all these episodes but I'm like where is it? <laughs> um, yeah, New York. Um, so it had to be urban, but I didn't want it to be New York because that was a little too much pressure to get everything in New York correct, having never been there. <laughs> so I wanted to make it fictitious. I knew that. So oh, yeah, enter Burgundy, uh, the, the 
you know, the doppelganger of New York. And then you think of, you know, I guess the concepts that you want in your story. I wanted a, originally it was supposed to be in the past, and then I realized, you know, actually from bringing to writer's group that it was better to have it modern day. You know, that was what we know. That's, I thought the technology would ruin the magic, but it really didn't. It worked out okay. Um, so yeah, it had to be urban, it had to be present day, and then I, I want these magical beings, I want magic in there, so how would that then change what we already know? So then, you know, that then created, I needed a group of white mages, uh, but they're not always super good, they're a little bit like an institutional uh, controlling group, they decide kind of what magic gets used and why, which also helped because then I know that, you know, once you have magic, then it's like, well, why isn't this character just using magic? Why isn't, why don't they just use, solve this with magic? Well, they can't. You got to have some kind of control over your element, whatever it is. Uh, so then enter the Holy Office, which is a branch of the Catholic Church, actually, in, in the real, they're actually, I think, I think they were the Inquisition. They became the Holy Office, something like that, or maybe uh, something like that. Um, they're supposed to be the evolved form of the Inquisition in, in, in the book Monster Force. Um, so then I had kind of the basic elements there, you know, uh, and then you kind of get into each of these scenes and you think, well, like when they find the body, it's, uh, it was supposed to be kind of gritty, uh, metal neck is this kind of ghetto-ish kind of region, it's industrial, you know, it's not great. Uh, and then, or if you have a, uh, a scene that's, you know, particularly, I don't know, suspenseful or action-packed, it helps to have, you know, like a scenery that, that works for that. So there's a scene that I really like, uh, that I really enjoyed writing in, in Murder and Metal Neck, uh, where they go into the underworks. And the underworks are this very, very quiet, because it's deep underground, but very dirty, smelly, grimy, disgusting place. And they're getting really close to sort of the uh, appalling end of this mystery. So that was sort of fed into that whole uh, scene. I kind of knew where it was going, and I got a feeling, so it's turned into this gritty, slimy, dirty, disgusting place that I thought worked really well. And it, is it, did you say that's toward the end? Of, it is. It's yeah. near It's near the end. It's near the finale of the story. So yeah. it adds a lot of tension. Yes, that. yep. That was yeah. also the thought uh, that, and I, yeah, definitely it helps to draw from uh, like other things and mo that's also where it helps draw from like movies and things like that. Oh yeah. When I was writing that scene, I was thinking of a, a game that I had played actually, one of my favorite games, um, Elder Scrolls Morrowind. And there was these like uh, underworks that you'd always go into. And I remember uh, there was one you'd have these there was these big deep canals, and then you'd have uh, you'd walk along the edges, yeah. and there'd be monsters in the canals, and you'd go to end and you turn, and there'd be something that's about to kill you, you know. And it was very suspenseful, and it was very uh, tense. So that was kind of where that started. Also, that was what the underworks were were modeled after was was Morrowind. <laughs> Mm -hmm. When did you first start writing? I mean, was it just when you were really young, and and or, or how did you know how did that? Uh, yeah, it was when I was really young. I think the first story that I ever <laughs> wrote was like you know beginning to end kind of stuff. It was gosh, probably when I was like fifth grade, which just sounds so stupid. Like everybody starts writing around fifth grade. You know, that's when you like I don't know. I guess learn to write in a, like an even a more you know more than like your name or whatever. But uh, I, it was because I think it was just when I was little, I was bored. And I think my mom told me, well, why don't you write something? It was something, yeah. you know, something like that. So I started writing a little bit. And then I, in middle school, there was a teacher that I really wanted to impress. That she, uh, cause I have an older brother and she had just loved my older brother and he was, you know, really good. And uh, I was like, well, I want this teacher to really like me. So I wrote a story and she just, it blew her socks off. And I had never gotten... You know, and it's, you know, you get encouragement from your family, but it's different when you hear it from someone who's not your family. You know, you believe it more because uh, your family has to be nice to you, don't they? <laughs> Especially when you're in middle school because they don't want you to go off to the deep end. But, um, yeah, and this teacher was just blown away and she said what a great writer I was. And she was just very, very encouraging. And uh, that, that actually really, I think it changed my life because that was when I really started writing as yeah. like a hobby. She helped me because I was so frustrated with uh, computers at the time. We had this terrible program to try to learn how to type, and I just, oh man, I about put a fist through the screen. I was so mad at it. <laughs> but uh, she helped. She said, well, you can do this project, and you don't have to do this other one, but you got to do it on the computer. 
And I was like, oh, all right, I can handle that, sure. She's like, I want you to write a complete story in the amount of time that we're, other students are doing this project, and you gotta write it on the computer. And that was when I started actually learning how to type. There's no way that I could do what I do now if I didn't have those kind of computer skills. And I mean, of, yeah. of course, you know, the, the, the era that we live in now that if you do not have computer skills, you will not survive, <laughs> you know? So I it's mean, really it's, lucky that, you know, that she lucky. saw that yeah. and, and uh, you know, gave you that opportunity. It was, really I don't cool. know, I, I, I think I would be completely different if not for, if not for, that, for that teacher and not, not if not for that moment. It would, I don't know what my life would be like. <laughs> that, that's really neat. I've read enough of your books and short stories to know something about the quality of your writing, and I'm envious, you know. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the way, the way that you direct through directors through a story and and visual uh, visualizing things plus you um give little uh, inanimate objects seem to almost have personalities somehow <laughs> and that's an interesting use of words i like that mm -hmm. a lot um and uh, so I, I wrote down after i said said that so what's the question here <laughs> there's no question people you you gotta <laughs> check this person out here okay it's really great and if you're a writer you you know, you got to study, okay? <laughs> but one of the things that I, I, you know, I thought about, I was thinking that I, every writer has their strengths and weaknesses, you right, know. Yeah. But well, um, and, and anyone that any, anything that anyone does, I'm sure that that's true, strengths and weaknesses. There's no yeah. way around, yeah. yeah. So when you read a book, when I read a book, I try to think of, you know, if I have a passage that just gives me, if there's a passage that just gives me chills, or like a character that I just love to hate, or, or you know, whatever, then yeah. it's like, how did they do that? What moments, what words, you know, what was it that made me feel like this? And I think that's another really big thing that, you know, what made this so successful? Why do I want to keep turning the page, you know? So you're, uh, you're talking about analyzing it yeah, so that absolutely. you can pick up those patterns and make them work for you. Sure, yeah. Yep. And well, I don't know, hopefully that, that has come through a little bit, <laughs> I hope. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I, I don't mean that uh, nobody has to do anything like if I think about Mozart, you know, uh, he, you know, yes, he could compose things in his head, but you know that he, he worked really hard. Right, exactly. he, he was compelled, yeah. you know, uh, and I found that almost everybody that, that um, I've, uh, you know, that we've heard about or people that I know, uh, they're obsessed with a particular thing. Exactly. It just, it makes them crazy that they can't do it when they can't do it. And, I, uh, I would agree, yeah. Somebody once put it really well to me that... Uh, uh, in particular was with writing, but it can work with whatever is your thing, you know. If someone would pay you not to do it, and you couldn't do it, but you'd still get paid, would you do that? And I think if the answer is, I would not take that deal, then that means you should uh. probably do it, because you want to do it because you enjoy it, and, you know, not because you want to be good at it or get paid at it or whatever. It's just because you... If, if you got paid not to do it, would you would you sneak and do it anyway? You're right. Yeah. Exactly. I was thinking about that. I was like, well, I'd probably try not to, but then I'd try to do it anyway. And they'd be like, nope, sorry. No more paycheck for you. So, okay, I haven't written anything, but my mind won't stop telling exactly, that story. Yeah. You know? And I think that's, that's, I think, what it is. And maybe, I don't know, I guess that's just maybe another word for talent, but I guess... And a lot of people disagree with this, that they, 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 you know, many people would say, no, just talent exists. You are predisposed to sing, you're predisposed to write, you're predisposed to paint. And I don't think that's true. I think uh, people are good at it because they work at it. Or, and maybe it's a way that they think about it, you know, it could be a little bit of that too. Uh, but it's because they, they analyze what other people are doing, what's worked, you know, they, they work at it a lot. They, you know, they do all the little nitpicky mechanical things. They memorize the rules, you know, not just the fun stuff, but the, the not fun stuff too. I, yeah, I think it's both. Yeah. I think the, 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 there's a compulsion, and uh, but I think there's a, a certain talent. Um, uh, I I know that most of the time when I write dialogue, it seems like real people talking, mm -hmm. and I've read plenty of people who uh, don't seem to have that ability. You know, yes, for they sure. can, th and they have to work hard at that, mm -hmm. really hard at that, yeah. and that that came fairly easily to me, and I didn't realize until I was seeing other people's stuff. I'm going. Why don't they don't they know that <laughs> that person could like be humans? thinking that? You know? <laughs> yeah, why don't they talk like people? <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah. right. Why do they sound like robots? <laughs> this yeah. is not a science fiction story, you know. <laughs> and it so could be it could be the way, you know, that each person thinks that some people are better than at describing a scene. Maybe that's just the way they think or you're you know, better at dialogue because it's the way that your mind that's works, right. you know. Yep. I don't know. Could be. You recently took an extended trip around the world would you say or was it 
Just uh, not around the world. There was no, I only went three places, <laughs> three, okay. three countries. I went three countries. So let's first tell us what countries you went to, and, and, and I'm interested in how they might have influenced your writing, or have you even noticed anything sure. about that? Um, so let's see. It was in February that I went to Australia. I had always wanted to go to Australia, and it seemed like a good time to go. It was a little bit right after the election, so that could have been oh, part of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm investigating like, I'm other places that I want to live. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, Australia. And I was uh, just, you know, I was doing freelance work at the time online, so I wanted to pick places that I could still do what I, what I can do, so they had to have good internet, which Australia turned out to be a pick for, for good internet. No. They they have they have good decent internet for most of the places that I went to but so yeah I went to let's see so I went through Queensland in Australia the Queensland uh, region and I started at the bottom of Queensland in Brisbane Brisbane uh, I went up the coast to uh, the one of the bigger cities that was near the top uh, the last on the Queensland rail line as it were <laughs> I couldn't get any further because that was the last stop on the train uh, and then I went to Japan and I stayed in Japan well I was in Australia for a little over two months and uh, oh I had it was it early beach I think it maybe it was early beach was the la was the last place I was at in Australia that might have been it I have to double check that one um, I was there for about two and a half half months I think in Australia two months two and a half months and then I went to Japan and I'd always wanted to go to Japan I wanted to go particularly to Tokyo and I stayed almost three months which is as long as they'll let you stay <laughs> in Japan I went to let's see uh, Tokyo Kyoto Nara Osaka uh, briefly in Nagoya um, and then several other kind of outskirts I guess like towns near Tokyo but you know kind of in that sort of metro area that was really great that was I don't know every, everything I wanted it to be Japan was amazing uh, and then I went to South Korea one of my friends had taught there for a year and she had told me all about it and uh, I wanted to check it out for myself and she came and visited me there also and we had a great time um, and I was there I think about a maybe it was about a month near about a month um, and then came back home. So was it almost a half year trip then? It no. was. I believe it was about five months. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if the math ex exactly works out with the times that I said. But yeah, it was about five months. It, I had planned to be about six to eight, but uh, I don't know. I guess by that time I was a, I was a little bit homesick. <laughs> so has any uh, that you recognize, anything um, oh, yeah, um, kind of crept into your work and give, give it flavor? I think so and I think maybe it's taken a little time to because at the time I was finishing up actually the second I had almost finished the second Monster Force book so I was still kind of in that series but now that I'm kind of back home and I'm able to sort of reflect on I don't know every, all the places I've been and the things that I've seen that there's definitely uh, I kind of want to I guess think outside my traditional box a little bit more I guess it also it just inspired me to learn more about like other cultures and um, things like that and I find myself thinking more about um, yeah like other cultures and the way that they interpret uh, stories and the way that they interpret like myths particularly for for Monster Force um, all of those kind of things it was also it was a good it was really yeah, it was really good to see how other people have a sort of like narrative in especially in like places uh, there was one that stuck out. I was keeping a blog for a little bit about the things that I'd seen and trying to relate it back to writing, you know. Um, and there was a few places in Japan in particular where uh, just the, the kind of way that they expressed narrative through these places or through these things for, it was really striking, I thought. Uh, the one, one that stood out to me was um, the graves of the uh, 40, 47 Ronin, I think. Yeah, 47 Ronin. And that was just incredible. It was an incredible place. It almost had like, and I'm not a really superstitious person, but it had a sort of presence about it that was, it was striking. And uh, there was that. And then I went to the, um, the theater uh, and I saw a play there that was, it was done in Japanese. It was at the, Tok the, the big theater in Tokyo. Um, but they gave you, they were able to translate it for you. Uh, in, they gave you a little box. They gave you an English translation of this play and what was going on. Thank goodness, because I still would have gone, but I would not have really known what the heck was going on. Um, and that was really striking, the way that they were able to tell these stories and the stories themselves. 
And, I, and I'm sure there was, it was difficult to translate, because I, I know Japanese and English do not always translate, you know, one to one. Um, but even the translation was striking. There was a moment that I can remember in one of these plays where uh, it, there was a, um, if I'm remembering correctly, there was a, a man, he was a head of family kind of person, and he had had an affair with this younger woman, and his wife had found out about it and had just destroyed his family and had destroyed this other younger woman's life too. And uh, he had said a line that was something like, uh, I'm drenched in villainy. And I was just like, wow, that's, yes, that is great. I love that. And just, it was also, I mean, I don't understand Japanese, but I could see that that line had happened when he, and I knew when he had said it, because it was the way that he said it. And that sort of transcended, I guess, like words. It was the way he said it. That was just like, man, it really made an impact on me. <laughs> it was something else. It was really cool. Well, uh, one other, th there were two things I want to do. One is, um, uh, we're calling this the stocking feet interviews. And so you need to hold up, because those are actually pretty cool stockings. <laughs> yeah. I'm just wearing a little white, you know. Little white I like ones. my Let my me see, is that picking up? There, it picks it up really yeah. nicely. Yeah. Good, good way to go. <laughs> I usually, I, in this case, I happen to have matching socks on right now, but usually they don't match. <laughs> oh. So they weren't going to match today, but I thought, all right, I'll, I'll match them up today. <laughs> <laughs> and my feet are actually getting cold doing this. I don't have it. Um, uh, and, but I wanted to have, uh, for the people who are uh, now in the video, I can, I can uh, put text and I would show um, uh, your, your name and for people to find you on sure. Amazon. Yeah. They're going to want to know. So it, it, it spell your last, it's Sam, S-A-M, that's real standard, yeah. but spell your last name for it's us. S-T-E-M-L-E-R, Stemmler. That's real it's an straight. old German name, I think. Yep. Oh, is that right? I think so, yeah. It's probably pronounced Stemmler. 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 <laughs> so uh, um, that find that on Amazon, and uh, um, I guess that, I don't know how else to wind up uh, uh, something like that. Yeah, no, that's how they do it in the in the talk shows, the comedian talk shows. Find this on Amazon, give it a look, give it a read, and yeah, you'll enjoy it. You'll 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 be glad you did. Yeah. And then and then <laughs> uh, and then and then give it a review too. That would yes, be nice. Yes, that's yeah. the other thing. Yes, reviews if we can briefly. That is the most important thing you can do to support. Uh, probably not even just an author, but a musician, an uh, independent artist, whatever. Yeah. Buy their stuff, review their stuff. It's the best thing you can do. Oh, and this is important too. Um, how would they, how could they reach you? Um, is there a, a way oh, to yeah. email? Yeah, absolutely. Email is my preferred form of communication. Anybody can send me an email anytime. I don't care. It's all good. It's just, mine's really easy. I managed to corner the market on this email really quick. It was, it's just Sam Stemler at Gmail. No, at no easy. uppercase, no nothing. So yeah, anybody yeah. can reach out for, you know, Great. whatever. The the reason I, uh, I want to mention this, and we didn't talk about it earlier, is that um, one of the things that they, that has been talked about um, about self-publishing is email getting emails of people who like your work is really important because then you can announce ahead of time when another one book is coming out yeah um, and, and one of the problems with traditional publishing they they s put the books in the stores and so on but they have no idea who the buyers are which means... Well, you'd be surprised. <laughs> they know, I think, a lot more than they ever used to about who the buyers are. Well, they probably have a pretty good... Uh, not, not they're not sharing it with the authors, though. That's a problem. Yeah, not individually they don't know who the, who the buyers are. But, I mean, I guess they know their audience very they, well. They understand some of that, but not, yeah. not this direct... And there's yeah. a problem with direct, uh, direct marketing. And um, if... If we can, if we can get your email addresses, then we can just we don't have to, you know, pound you with stuff. <laughs> we can just send you things, let you know interest things you might be interested yeah. in, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is is really valuable too. Um, I've been hearing more, especially about uh, musicians who are are trying to uh, have little uh, little insight, and in they want to know more than just the song. Right. They want to know what inspired this song, and mm -hmm. you know, in our case, what inspired uh, what inspired the book, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's an important point, though, especially if we can get it in somewhere. Is that, and I have a on my oh, maybe we can put that in the the bottom. I have on my blog for Monster Force, um, 
I think it's just Monster Force Books at Blogspot. If you type that in, you can probably find it. <laughs> um, there's a, a form that you fill out. You just your name and your email, and then you know you can get updates for when the next book's coming out, which actually will be. I got to take a little break because the marketing stuff kind of killed me, but um, the the next book will be coming out fairly soon. It's it's moving along that quickly. Then. Well, the second book is is I mean the rough draft is done. It needs a yeah. lot of editing. I got all those superfluous scenes I was talking about. Those got to be all taken out. But <laughs> all the stuff we talked about earlier. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, no, it's it's basically done. I just need to. It's just editing now. The the story's written though. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess one thing we can say is, that, okay, Sam, you can put your shoes back on now. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> that might be a good ending. I'd love to stay in the socks, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's that time. <laughs> cool.